Hi, and welcome to this webinar on the underlying concepts behind splice variant analysis for the human transcriptome array. Today we'll be going over an introduction to what splice variant analysis is and the underlying concepts for it, the definition for what the splice index is, the criteria for doing splice variant analysis, which is specifically the gene must be expressed in both conditions and that the exon must be expressed in at least one of them, and then the default settings for splice variant analysis uh, using the transcriptome analysis software, or TAC as it will be known from now on. You're all familiar with what alternative splicing is, but I thought I'd just review it quickly here. As you can see in the pre-mRNA state, or sort of the native state from reading from the DNA, you have red, yellow, green, and blue. And then it's possible to make different protein isoforms, which is a combination of those uh, exons put together in different ways. And the example is shown here on the left. We've got red, followed by yellow, followed by blue, which means we've skipped the green one. And then on the right, we see a different protein isoform, which is just the red, the green, and the blue. So if you think about these splicing events, so what, what would it look like when you do a diagram, this is sort of the standard diagram where the boxes are the exons, and if you think of these black lines as the junctions between the exons, if you were to actually measure the changes for these various entities in a splicing event, what you can expect to see is something like this. You can look at the differential expression of the exon itself, because if the exon goes in or out, that exon expression level will change. In addition, you can look at the different levels of expression for the adjacent probe sets, or the adjacent adapters, if you will. And so in this case, we have these guys that are coming out and connecting this exon to either the surrounding exons. At least two of those should also move in the same direction as the exon itself. So if the exon is spliced in, then these two of these junctions should also be included. In addition, you can look at the differential expression for one of the exon skipping events, or overhead probe sets, as I sometimes like to call them. If we're still looking at this exon right here, you can see these probe sets go over the top of it. And so if this guy is spliced in, then when this goes in, then one of these two junctions should, go, should be decreased. So if we look at an example here, and in this case we have no gene level change between condition 1 and condition 2, and we have a case where we have three exons, A, B, and D, in condition 1, and in condition 2, we have A, B, C, and D. And we've assigned some arbitrary expression values to condition 1 and condition 2 to show, you know, if you go no change between condition 1 and 2, so this stays at 2, stays at 4. Here, for exon C, it's gone from 0.1 to 4 and from 2 to 2. Okay, so then if we do sort of a simple comparison of condition 1 versus condition 2, what you'll see is here, we have a ratio that's less than 1, so we've highlighted in blue, which means that we've basically gone from a little bit in little or no expression in condition 1 to a large amount in condition 2. Okay, and the opposite is true for one of these guys that's gone over its head, right? So this is expressed highly. So the one thing to note is that the color is the opposite of the event. So when you're looking at the splicing in this case, red indicates that it's been a loss, and blue is the indication of a gain. Now, if we make the situation slightly more complicated, in this case, condition 1, the base gene level expression is at 6, and in condition 2, the base gene level expression is at 3. So basically what I've done is taken the same slide, the same example as before, but now I've just multiplied all the values in here by 2. Okay, so when you do a simple condition 1 over condition 2 full change calculation, you'll see that basically all of the exons now are differentially regulated between the two, or appear to be. So simply doing this is not going to be a way for you to investigate whether there's any splice variant changes or any specific things going on here because the, the individual splicing events are contaminated or hidden, if you will, underneath the gene level expression changes or hidden by them. So what we've done is we've come up with a way to sort of work around that. This was referred to as normalizing the exon and junction expression values by the level of gene expression. This is in a short way, or in a fancy way of saying, we simply divide the individual exon level or junction level expression values by the expression value of the whole gene. And then you take a ratio of the normalized signal estimates to each other from one condition to the other, and that's what we refer to as the splice index. So here you can see how this is calculated. So if we look at exon 1, we take the signal from exon 1 and condition 1, and we divide it by the overall signal for gene 1 in that condition. The same thing for exon 1 in condition 2 and the gene in condition 2. Right. 
and then you get the splice index. From further information, you can refer to this paper here. So an example of this is going to be shown in the next slide. So if we take the same example we had before, which was the condition 1, the gene expression is at 6, and now this time what we're going to do is we're going to do the normalization for it. So we're going to take all these expression values and we're going to divide them by 6 in this case. Okay, now if we look at condition 2, where the gene level expression was 3, and we'll take the same expression values that were present in the first example, and now we're going to divide them all by 3. And so what we have here is that. Now we're going to take those two pictures, if you will, the condition 1 normalized and condition 2 normalized, and divide them by each other, and look at the splice index for this case. So if you remember the first time we had 4 divided by 2, which was a 2, which ended up being red, and so then that was confusing because you couldn't tell that from the real splice changes. Well now you have 4 6 divided by 2 thirds, which is actually 1. Right? And so you can see, if you march through exon by exon and junction by junction, that you can see we've gone back now to that picture that we can use to interpret what's going on. In which case we have an exon, which has got a ratio that's less than 1, right? which means that it is now it's gone up in condition 2 versus condition 1, so it's larger in condition 2 or condition 1, which means we've had an example where we've gained an exon. So here's an example of gaining the exon between condition 1 and condition 2. So that's a relatively simple case when we only have a single transcript represented in each condition. It's also possible in biology to have a pool of transcripts present, if you will. And so just to get comfortable with it, I've you know, done the same thought experiment, if you will, where you have two conditions. Here, 1, condition 1 and condition 2. Here, the baseline gene expression value is 12. And in this case, it's of 6. Right? And here we have three transcripts, and here we have two. Again, just to remind you, if you simply do the fold change, that's not going to work. So we're going to want to look at the normalized, which is basically divide the individual exon or junction expression by the overall expression for that gene in that condition. So here, if we look at the normalized conditions, we can start to investigate whether we see any um, exon events happening. Okay, and so again, you can see here, we have two, three, and four events that have happened, which represent, in this case, the gaining of an exon here. And here we have the loss of one of the exons. And now one of the interesting things to put your head around when you're thinking about this is that the loss of a deletion is actually the same as the gaining of an exon. Right, so both of these appear to be blue because the signal intensities have gone up. But here we had two deletions and a single exon. And we've now gone to a state where we have one deletion and, an ex and the exon. And this is basically the equivalent of gaining an exon. So it's not always as straightforward as simply going from no exon to an exon. You can also have this case where you've gone from a sort of this exon is less representative in the pool and now its representation has, has been increased in the pool. So in, there's some additional criteria that need to be applied to the examination before you proceed. First, the gene must be expressed in both conditions. Why is this? Well, because if you go from off to on, you're not going to be able to further tease out any splice variant changes or any exon splicing event changes. The second is the exon must be expressed in at least one of the conditions because otherwise you're just going to be looking at noise within the, you know, if it's not expressed at all, it's just some signal estimates will be bouncing up and down and so you'll, you could potentially find differences there that aren't biologically relevant. So again, the gene must be expressed in both conditions and the exon must be, pre must be expressed in at least one of the two conditions you're studying. So how does one go about determining whether a gene is expressed? The first is that we want to make sure that at least 50% of the samples that you're looking at, that gene's expressed in. Okay, So that's how we call a gene expressed in a condition, is at least half of the samples express it. Um, so how do we determine whether a gene is expressed? Well, if we look at at least 50% of the exons of the gene must be expressed. And then how do we determine whether an exon can be sort of counted towards this and that we want the exon to be present in at least half of the transcripts for a gene. So if we look here, starting at the bottom, here we have an example of a gene that has nine different exons, uh, it has eight exons in it, sorry, and they're numbered here one through eight. So the first thing we want to look at is for an exon to be considered, it must be present in at least half of the transcripts. So of the eight exons, we can see that five, six, and seven are not present in at least four of the transcripts. So they're not going to be counted anymore. 
So the next thing that we want to look at is for a gene to be expressed, at least half of those exons that we've identified must be expressed. So here we have an example. We have the, the five exons. Then we look at the DABGP value, and we want to make sure that it's less than 0.05. That's what we're designing as our detection limit. In the TAC software, it's possible to adjust this, but this is the default setting. So if we look at, in sample one, we've got PSR one, three, and eight are all expressed. So this gene would then be expressed in sample one because three out of five it's present in. If we look at sample two, PSR one and eight are expressed, but two, three, and four are not. So we have two out of five. So this gene, in this case, the gene is not present in this sample. But in sample three, they're all expressed. This is clearly some made up data just for demonstration purposes. But in this case, you can see that we have for this condition, at least two out of the three samples have shown it, so greater than 50% of the samples express this gene, and so therefore this gene is considered to be expressed in this condition. And that's what's shown here, so we have two out of the three, so that at least 50% of the samples, in this case two out of three, the gene is expressed, therefore it's considered to be expressed in this condition. So is the exon expressed in the condition? This is a little bit more straightforward. For an exon, the exon must be expressed in at least 50% of the samples for a condition. Right? So here we have PSR 1 through 8. We have samples 1, 2, and 3. In this case, 3 out of the 3 show that the PSR is expressed. So it clearly can be included in the splice variant analysis. The same thing is true for 5, 6, 7, 8, and this junction probe down here at the bottom of 1. Now if we look at PSR 2 and 4, we can see that only 1 out of the 3 are expressed. So this means that just looking at this condition, we should not include PSR2 and 4. We need to look at the second condition and see if either PSR2 or 4 is expressed in that condition. And if it is, then it can be included in the splice variant analysis. If it is not expressed in either of the conditions, then that exon or junction probe should not be considered for splice variant analysis. Within the TAC software, the gene level and exon level signal calculations aren't simply a mean. What we've done is chosen to use the one-step Tukey byweight average. In this case, the median is determined to define the center of the data, and then the distance of each data point from the median is determined. And this value is used to sort of weight how much each of those will contribute to the average. In this way, outliers have much less of an effect on the average. If you want more information about the one-step Tukey byweight average, uh, please consult this white paper available on affymetrics.com. Within the TAC software, there are some additional default settings for splice variant analysis. By default, the FDR is set so that it is less than 0 0.05. Uh, we've set the splice index as greater than 2 or less than minus 2, so you're always looking for splicing events with at least a two-fold change and that the results will be sorted by the splice index in descending value. Okay, note that the data is grouped by gene so that if you have a gene with the event with the largest splice index, it will be on the top. And then there will be a series of, of splice events that may not be significant within that gene and then you go to the next gene which contains a, a significant splicing event sorted by that. This will become more clear in the demo that I'd like to refer to you to, which will be on how to do splice variant analysis within the TAC software. And this will be available on affymetrics.com also. So I'd like to thank you for paying attention. Before we draw to a conclusion here, I'd like to point out the additional resources available on affymetrics.com. There's the NetFX Analysis Center, in which you can get additional information on probe sets and probe information. There are other manuals and white papers available for Expression Console, Transcriptome Analysis Console, and the white papers around the Tukey Byweight and other white papers that have been referred to in this presentation. There are other training videos on Expression Console and TAC available. And as always, if you have further questions, you can feel free to contact technical support at the 188 DNA chip or via the support at affymetrics.com email address. Thanks for your attention.